Hey everyone, and thanks again for joining us here at the Foundry Church. My name is Justin Colleen, and I'm the worship director here. We are so glad that you're here to see all that God is doing in and through his church right now. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, make sure you go and like our Facebook page. There you will find additional content as well as the teachings that you see here on our YouTube channel. And speaking of, if you haven't subscribed for that yet, make sure you do that right now while you're here. Uh, with that said, let's go to our summer series right now, Judah, the Kingdom Chronicles. I was only seven when they crowned me King Joash. I didn't know anything that laid beyond the temple walls where they hid me. I did my best to please him, to please Jehoiada. He had raised me after all. But after he died, everything changed. I had to figure out things for myself. I had to make my own decisions. My whole life had been confined by someone else's rules, by someone else's God. Well, not anymore. No one is going to tell me what to do. I am king. Well, hey, Foundry Church. Um, happy birthday to America. It has been a great weekend, hopefully for you and your friends and family. Quick question by show of hands. Your preference. Bomb pop or cheeseburger? This helps define what kind of American you are. How many bomb pops do we have in the room? Oh, how many cheeseburgers? <laughs> Kyle, <laughs> you're the only bomb pop. So I'm going to quick give this to Kyle. All right. <laughs> I hope you had a great 4th of July celebration with your family. Uh, we're diving in today to the life of uh, Joe Ash. And as we do that, it, there's one of these central texts that jump right out of the story. And it's, uh, at first you think, oh yeah, that sounds kind of good. It says this, Joe Ash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the years of Jehoiada, the priest. When you read that, it sounds like, yeah, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the years of Jehoiada, the priest. The only problem is the king was Joash, not Jehoiada. Jehoiada was the faithful uh, high priest who helped hide Joash and helped uh, him and Josheba, his wife, helped save him and preserve his life and got, put him back on the, on the throne. And so we see that he was faithful and did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the days, all the years of Jehoiada the priest as he instructed him, Joash did what was right. And today we want to notice that Joash loved God when his hero was watching. It reminds me of when I was a little boy, my granddad uh, in Colorado owned um, a national car rental franchise. And, uh, and some car dealerships. And I was employed, I think actually illegally, because I was very much a child, but child labor laws back then, poo-shaw. Um, so uh, I would go and I would work for my granddad. He paid me. It was awesome. He also took me out to seafood every time, which is kind of weird. Like, it's what granddads would do. He'd be like, do you want to go have seafood? It's Tuesday, but okay. So we'd go have seafood, but um, I would wash cars for him, and I would detail the cars out, and it was fun because I got to drive. I mean, I was so little, I remember looking through the steering wheel, backing cars around, and washing them um, and putting them on the lot. When he was watching me, I did everything perfectly, everything perfectly. He had a pet peeve on his car lots that if he pulled into the car lot and all the cars were parked, but the wheels were off, Oh, that did not go well. And he'd come out and he'd say, Eric. And I was just like, yes, sir. He'd be like, come here. What do you think of those tires? I was like, I want them to be whatever you want them to be. I didn't even know. I was terrified, right? It was my granddad. And um, he'd say, and he'd just look at me and go, straighten them out. And I was like, yes, sir. And off I would go. But when he wasn't there, I didn't try as hard. His watching eye wasn't over me. I wasn't as nervous when the cat was away. Indeed, the mouse did play. And I was a little boy, and I found myself getting away with things that maybe I wouldn't. Oh, I know I wouldn't have it when he was there. 
I did all the right things when he was watching. But when he was away at the airport dealing with some car rental dealer, dealership things, I could be a little more free with what I did. Maybe I didn't vacuum under the mats as well as I did when he was there. So it's one of those things where we look at the story of Joash, and we want to put him into a certain light, but we have to recognize that in many ways, you and I fit in the same mold as young King Joash, who took the throne at seven, and we find him doing some amazing things in the beginning of his tenure as king. Amazing things happen in his reign, because what happens is he has a love for the temple of God, and for the people of God, because he has, he has experienced and witnessed the evil. And he's been told the stories by Josheba, by um, Jehoiada, and he is king, and they have helped him rule. So when he gets a little older, he decides to put out the temple treasury boxes again. Like we have giving boxes at the foundry. He put out the giving boxes, and he said to the Levites, go and collect the money due to the house of God so we can make repairs and get things right, so we can tear down the Baal, the Baal um, altars that are in the temple that Athaliah's sons had built up so that we can do away with all that and get the temple out of disrepair. The Levites didn't even fully obey him at first. And he went back to Jehoiada and he said, why are the Levites not putting out the temple treasury boxes? Tell them to go and collect the tax for what is due in the house of the Lord according to the law of Moses. It seems like he really had a good heart for things and what he did was quite amazing. He put the temple back in order. He rebuilt and it says that they would go and pick up the boxes, the big cases of money and carry them in and have to empty them because people were joyfully giving to the house of God and for the work of the temple. The people wanted their king to fear God. They wanted to be a part of faithful covenant worship. So they were giving towards it, and the temple was restored and re, um, refilled with the articles of gold and silver and the different utensils. It was an amazing time. He did great things, and what we find is that um, in this young life, you see him living faithfully, and you had to almost imagine Jehoiada, who had been high priest when Athaliah was there and her sons were making sacrifices to the gods Baal and Ashtoreth in the temple to now step back and later in Jehoiada's life looking at the temple and seeing it with the faithful worship of God going on and celebrating what goodness God had brought about and Jehoiada, well, Jehoiada was about 130 years old when he died. He lived a long life and the saddest ending began. One of the saddest endings begins in this part of the story because young Jehoiada was faithful to God all the day, or young Joash was faithful to God all the days of Jehoiada's life. So what happens when his bedrock dies, when the person he's been following the rules for is no longer there? What happens? Well, it's a tragic ending. It's one of the saddest stories in Scripture because we remember from last week when we talk about the story of Athaliah and we talk about um, of King Jehoram and the different things that went on and the way the, the, the community of God f- fell into apostasy and how Jehoiada saved the kingdom and how Joash, young Joash, was saved as the remnant of King David, as the, as the last living heir to King David. And here he is on the throne. Jehoiada dies and the saddest ending begins because after the death of Jehoiada, the officials of Judah came and paid homage to young Joash. And it says, and it's an interesting line, how how scripture words it. It says they came and they paid homage to him and he listened to them. He listened to them paying homage and you can almost see him saying like, it's about time. Because Jehoiada, by kind of de facto presence and leadership and bravery, I mean, when Jehoiada died, he was buried among the, t- the tombs of the kings. He was remembered as a king of Israel for his goodness. Now, he never was a monarch, but he was buried in the tomb of the kings, which we know not all the kings were. So it was a big deal. And when he dies, all of a sudden, everybody's now coming to young Joash, and he listens to them. And he began to abandon the temple of God shortly after uh, Jehoiada dies. He abandons the temple of God, and they began to worship at the Ashtoreth poles, at the Baals, and 
the Lord sent prophets to him to come and call him out of this, of this behavior of leading the people of God astray. And the Spirit of God came on Zechariah. And this is really, this is probably the hardest part of this story for me. Zechariah comes to him and he speaks out against him. And, and we'll read the text later, but he speaks out a prophecy and a word of God against King Joash. And King Joash doesn't like it. And he puts to death Zechariah. And it's interesting where he's put to death. He is put to death standing between the altar and the colonnade of the Lord's temple. Where was Joash standing when Athaliah spotted him? If you remember the story from last week, he was standing between the altar and the Lord's temple. And he put to death the Lord's prophet, Zechariah, the priest, the son of Jehoiada, at the very place where his life had not only been spared, but Jehoiada said, surround the king, protect him, guard him with your life. He killed Zechariah. He put him to death right where his life had been spared and brought up to prominence as the monarch. He put him to death right there. And Jehoash ends up living a life where he loses everything. Nothing of what he gains in his early years is retained because he turned from the Lord and the Lord turned from him. He turned from the Lord so much so that the son of the man and woman who saved him, he put to death. And I will tell you this, his first six years were spent in the temple. Zechariah would have been as much a brother to Joash as anyone. He would have been family. They would have known each other since their youngest years. And in the end, we know this, that he was buried outside the city in the tombs, but not the tomb of the kings. What a brutally sad ending for this young man. But it causes us to ask a question. Who is your hero in the faith? Who is your hero in the faith? I don't know, does anybody else have a hero in the faith? I can't really see out right now, but anybody? I super do. I, I, I do. I know this. Um, a number of my instructors, uh, leaders in life, and professors have been, and I, I will say this, and I love him so much. Dr. Tim Brown at Western Seminary is probably the most often impersonated preacher I've ever seen in my life. If you go to Western Seminary, am I right? Well, I know a student is here with us today, and they're like, preach? Because if you go to Western Seminary and they take preaching with Tim Brown, it was amazing to me to watch all the first-year preaching students do the worst impression, their very best at it, but their worst impression of Tim Brown. It was all his motions. They even stole his stories sometimes, which you're like, oh, that's kind of balky. But they, they looked up to him. He was, he's such a good teacher that they imitated him trying to find their own voice. They were trying to find their own voice. And Tim Brown was quite often one of those people who um, is a hero in the faith to young pastors and young leaders. And Tim is a great leader. I love him. We've, he's preached here before. He's a mentor and friend in my life. I adore him, but I think he would say, like, it's a little weird when guys start showing up who are in their mid-20s wearing elbow patches and bow ties and talking like you. It's just shady. I remember seeing it, and I was like, oh, nerd alert. Oh, my gosh. I don't know if you can say that in a church, but it super had a nerd alert to it because you're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? That's not you. You're 23. You can't afford a bow tie. You can barely bow tie your shoes. Like, what are you doing? But they would impersonate him. They wanted to be like him. They wanted to be like their hero in the faith. And I get it. We follow those who we admire. But the problem is, and Joash tells us, that transformation, not imitation, is what matters. And we have to lean in on that. We learned something when we were in Zambia. As a family, they hate chameleons there. The, the native population of Zambia are terrified of chameleons. So I did some research on them. They are not fast, to which I was like, am I a chameleon? <laughs> but, um, but they're not fast at all. They're super not fast. They have no venomous bite. They can't jump. And they have no claws. They're a hot dog in nature. They're easily eaten. They're the sheep of the lizard world. All they have is the capacity to imitate their surroundings. But people in Zambia, if they see them, they beat them to death. 
<laughs> they'd be like, you know, they're like, give me alien, whoop, hop, and you're like, he has no defenses, and they just lay there and die, and they're just like looking at him like, but they hated him because they imitated their surroundings. Chameleons can crawl on something, and they're already naturally the hue of like, you know, sticks and different things and leaves, but they can adapt their coloring to what they're on to protect them. It's their greatest defense because they don't really have an offense. And so they can imitate their surroundings, but they're not becoming their surroundings. At some point, we have to understand, if you're here in this church and you attend because you want me to like you, or a staff member, or an elder, or a teacher, or somebody, or or you're here because you're missionary dating, and you're like, I want to find a good Christian girl, and you're imitating the Christian life, I will tell you this, that imitation doesn't hold transformation is what God weighs. When we hold up transformation versus imitation, we have to look at chameleons as the great imitators, but there is in nature another, well, another kind of parallel to it. Caterpillars, fairly awful looking creatures. They just kind of slink along the ground. Some of them are hairy and weird, but, but if you watch, they'll go and they'll build a cocoon, and they go into that cocoon, and it must be, I've never been in one, but it must be a dark place. It's got to be a quiet place. It doesn't look like much is going on from the outside. And you can like thump the little shell and it's hardened. Things don't look like much is happening, but a caterpillar goes in and what comes out? A butterfly. And a butterfly is not a caterpillar with wings glued on taught to fly. It is a fully transformed creature. It is no longer something bound to to slink on the ground, but it flies. It becomes something different. And in the kingdom of God, that is the story for you and I. We will either be chameleons who imitate the faith, or we will become butterflies who become like Christ. We will leave our low, worm-like state. All my Reformed friends are like, that's right, what a worm we are. But um, the, our low, worm-like state, and because of the Spirit of God, because of the character of Christ, we are reformed and transformed into His image. We become so much more when we own it for ourselves. Because, and I, I like to say it this way, at some point the performance will end and your true character will come out. At some point, if you're imitating the faith, the performance will end. The curtain will drop and your true character will come out. Jehoiada lived to be 130. He couldn't hold on much longer. That's a long life. And when his life ended, Joash's real life began. And it was a tragic ending. If you haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to do the deep internal work of conviction and transformation in your life, I will tell you this, you are a poor imitation of a very good gospel. I don't mean it to be rude or offensive, but let's not play games here. If you're imitating the faith, you're failing at the game. Because it's not a game. It's a life. It's a life transformed into his life, into Jesus' life. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The gospel requires of us everything, everything that you are must be laid at the gospel. Your identity, everything that you feel identifies you is laid at the foot of the cross. And you are transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. The slow work of the Holy Spirit is the only thing that transforms. And I'll tell you this, if you don't allow the Spirit of God to do that slow work, you will imitate something new as it comes along. As something new comes along, you'll begin to imitate that and you'll take on the characteristics of another passionate leader or another entertainer or another person who has a voice of justice or a voice of this or that or the other. The gospel is a singular voice of Jesus Christ calling out to the world in redemption, follow me, follow me, Jesus says. Come be made into my image by your spirit. It is a slow, long obedience in the same direction. That's what we are called to. So we have to understand that if we're imitating it, one day we will just imitate something new. And it'll be according to our surroundings. Maybe a new job, a new culture or environment, a new college, a new city, a new employer. I don't know. A new group of friends. You'll become like them. You're a chameleon. Or you're a Christian and your identity doesn't shift based on the culture you're surrounded by. You are who you were made to be in the Holy Spirit. So the question is, 
Do you have a Joash in your life? This isn't just for us to say, am I a chameleon? This is also for us who live in roles of leadership in our life. And if you have, well, anyone who has influence over anyone else has a Joash. So I will tell you this. From the smallest child in this church to the most senior adult in this church, you have influence over people's lives. I've watched it in the lives of kids as I was in youth ministry. Students don't think they have influence. They hold tremendous influence over culture, over one another's, uh, one another's life. You can speak life or curses into one another. If you have influence over someone else's life, you have a Joash. You have someone following you. Maybe you're a teacher, maybe you're a coach, maybe a parent, a grandparent, a youth pastor, a leader, maybe you're somebody's boss in, a, in an organized setting of, of being like a leader. Awesome. You definitely have Joe Ashes. But if you're also a student who has influence in their school, you have people following you. And the question is, and I think this is maybe the, the, the danger signs we can see, is are people under you being transformed into the image God made them in and wants to remake them into? Or are they living up to your demands socially, morally, in any other way? I mean, how hard is it for us as parents not to demand of our children not to do something that would embarrass us, do something that would make us sad? Don't do these things. Why? Because it would reflect poorly on me. Right? But the reality for us is that when we look at this, we have to answer the questions as Jehoiadas, as leaders, as people of influence. Are we forcing people to live up to our demands and our control and standards? Or are we allowing them to become the men and women God made them to be? One of the hardest things I've had to learn as a parent is my kids aren't like me. And I'm so, I'm super duper thankful. Even my mom's happy for me. <laughs> like, you know, but I'm so glad to see some of the wonderful differences in them and get to experience that. But there's things I would like to demand of them because it's comfortable for me. But it wouldn't be the right thing for them to follow. Am I allowing them to become the men and women God made them to be? Are you allowing people underneath your influence to become who they're made to be or are they, um, kind of acclimatizing themselves to your mood, to your whim, and to your demands. Because if you're doing that, you're raising up people who are fickle chameleons who will imitate someone else at another point. We can't allow ourselves to do that. We can't, well, we have to, we have to see things that we can change and make an effort to lead with our hands open and trust that God of the universe, God, has a bigger plan for their lives than maybe we do. And we have to let people go and lead and serve as they have been made into the image of Christ to go and do something. We have to let them fly. Don't let your Joe ashes live under your thumb to their own demise. Give them the freedom to take risks. Pick them up when they fail. But trust that the God of the universe is working out in them his own image so that their lives will glorify him. I would like to read with you now the story of Joash. I want you to have it in your head and hold on to it with me as we read through it and we understand what goes on. It's uh, 2 Chronicles 24, 15 to 22. It says this, Now Jehoiada was old and full of years. He died at the age of 130. He was buried with the kings in the city of David because of the good he had done in Israel and in the temple. I love that. But then the wickedness of Joash erupts. After the death of Jehoiada, the officials of Judah came and paid homage to the king, and he listened to them. It says he listened to them. They abandoned the temple of the Lord. I, I just can't even imagine it. They abandoned the temple of the Lord, the God of their ancestors. They worshiped Asherah poles and idols. Because of their guilt, God's anger came on Judah and Jerusalem. Although the Lord sent prophets to the people to bring them back to him, and though they testified against Judah, its leaders, and Jehoash, or Joash, they would not listen. Their hearts were hardened. Then the Spirit of God came on Zechariah, son of Jehoiada, the son of Jehoiada, the brother to Joash, not biologically, but they were raised together. The son of Jehoiada, the priest, he stood before the 
the people and said, this is what God said. Why do you disobey? Why do you disobey the Lord's command? You will not prosper because you have forsaken the Lord. You have walked away from the Lord. So get this, you've forsaken him, but he now forsakes you. He turns his back on you, but they plotted against Zechariah. And by order of the king, they stoned him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. Jesus actually refers to this in the book of Matthew. Uh, Zechariah is the last known uh, Masoric text martyr. It's really a big deal that this happened. It's one of the most heart-wrenching stories because you look at it and you're like, man, this was your brother. These people saved you. It's a really big deal that they stoned him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. Even his father Jehoiada wouldn't put Athaliah to death in the temple. He took her out to the horse gate where she was executed. Joash had no regard for his blood and for the sacredness of the temple. King Joash didn't remember the kindness of Zechariah's father Jehoiada. He didn't remember what the, the kindness he had shown him. But he killed his son. And as he lay dying, these are the final words of Zechariah to King Joash, may the Lord see this and hold you to account. May the Lord see this and call you to account. May you be forced to deal with today the evil you have repaid. You have repaid evil for very good. And may God see this and deal with it. God sees and God knows the difference between a chameleon and a butterfly. And the reality is you can put the show on for only so long and eventually you and I become ourselves unless we're allowing God to transform us into himself. God knows the difference between a chameleon and a butterfly. And God will not tolerate or allow us to be men and women who imitate poorly the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will allow us to fully become ambassadors of it. He will transform us into his image. The problem is it costs you your life. It costs you everything in the here and now to follow him faithfully. But the promise is that God will never leave you and he will never forsake you. If you will live into his covenant, he will live into it. He will own into it. So here's what I would like to leave you with. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 is a critical text for you and I to grab onto in this story. It says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't be a chameleon to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to, to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and perfect will. I can tell you, God's heart broke when Joash made these decisions. God's heart broke when he did this because Joash had always secretly conformed to the pattern of the world. One day he would be king and he would do it his way. For you and for me, the calling is clear. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Become the butterfly, not by your own work, but by submitting and going into the cocoon, the crucible of hard work of being remade into the image of Christ. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and perfect will. May it be said of you and of me that those were people whose lives were lived in submission to the will of God and were evidenced by the transformation of who they are into who he is. May we be people defined by being more like Christ than we are like ourselves. May our identity slide away and his shine through. Pray with me. God, thank you for the story of Joash. And as heart-wrenching as it is, today we stand back, God, and we say thank you. Thank you that you won't allow us to just live a life of quiet, comfortable, chameleon faith where we can imitate things but never become, that you call us into yourself, that you call us to be filled with your spirit, transformed by the renewing of our minds. So we ask today, God, that we would not conform ourselves to this world, that you would call us forward, that we would actually respond with our time and giving generously of ourselves to the gospel kingdom so people would know the gospel and see it come in their lives. 
with our treasure, God, that we wouldn't hold back what we've earned, what is ours, but we would give generously to your work in your church and in the mission field for the glory of Jesus Christ. We wouldn't imitate Christian life by kind of participating, but we would give of ourselves our time, our treasure, and finally the talents, God, that you would allow us to use the gifts and talents you've put into our lives for the glory of Jesus Christ. Not be a bad imitation of active faith, but become the living embodiment of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May people see Jesus when we walk in the room. By the way, we treat them. By the way, we live, give, participate, and share in the life of the Christian church. May our lives be, individually and corporately, one that reflects well the glory of Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his obedience to you, his Father, so that all would see and know the way to salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks again for joining us for today's message. If you are looking for a way to prepare yourself for next week's message, make sure that you click the link below in the description right now and that'll take you to our weekly devotion page. Weekly devotions are a very important part to our weekly rhythm here at the Foundry Church. We really hope that God spoke to you in a powerful way today and we cannot wait to see you again next week.